I want to welcome you to our Animal Justice Academy Lunchtime Live, the first of 2024. Um, welcome to all you fine souls who are here in person live. Well, not in person, on Zoom live. And welcome to those who are watching the replay. We appreciate you being here too. Uh, we have Dr. Charu Chandrasekhar um, from the Canadian Center for Alternatives to Animal Methods joining us and our Director of Legal Advocacy at Animal Justice, Caitlin Mitchell. Hello, you two. Welcome. Now, I'm going to give a little bit of the official um, introduction, and as we bring them up on screen, um, first of all, Charu is the founder and executive director of Canada's first national hub dedicated exclusively to animal-free methods, so important in what we're going to be talking about today. The Canadian Centre for Alternatives to Animal Methods is located at the University of Windsor. Charu is an experienced scientist, a former animal researcher, and an animal animal lover. She promotes the replacement of animals in Canadian biomedical research, education, and regulatory testing through 21st century science, innovation, and ethics. And Caitlin, as Director of Legal Advocacy at Animal Justice, Caitlin works to stop the spread of ag-gag laws in Canada, improve legal protections for animals, and defend the rights of animal advocates. Prior to joining Animal Justice, which I, I feels like Caitlin's been with Animal Justice forever because we love her so much and she's just such a backbone of this organization. Caitlin worked for over a decade as a public interest environmental lawyer. Uh, her practice focused on promoting environmental justice and legal, re legal recognition of an environmental rights. She's appeared before numerous courts across the country, including the Supreme Court of Canada. So um, I wanna just welcome you to, and I realize that, um, uh, uh, Ina hasn't been able to spotlight us because I didn't make uh, I didn't make Charu a, a co-host. Are you are you all right now, Ina, to do that? <laughs> okay, thank you, darling. All right, we we need to see these beautiful faces up close. Um, so Charu, welcome. Caitlin, welcome. So good to see you both. Thank Yay. you. There we are. <laughs> thank you for having us. It's uh, it's great to be back here. Uh, yes, um, Charu, you are you have graced us with your um, your knowledge and your story and your experiences and your passion um, a few times here in the Animal Justice Academy. We so appreciate you. We we as Animal Justice work so closely with you. So you you are a true friend and ally. And Caitlin, you know I love you. You know I think you're just I call her the legal goddess, <laughs> and uh, she's hopping between all these issues. But this is one that's particularly been that you've been really immersed in in the last year, Caitlin. So I. I'm really excited to be able to get your um, your feedback on what it is that we need to do going forward from S5. So let's just start, let's back it up here, Charu, before we get into um, what's happening legally, uh, into non-animal testing methods, I think it's really important, especially because there's some new newbies here today in this issue. Um, to understand the stakes we're dealing with. So can you just give us a rundown of what it's like for animals being tested in Canada? Uh, I mean, you were an animal researcher yourself, so you know firsthand. Can you give us a little bit of a, an idea, a little overview? Okay, well, where do I even start? Is it such a, you know, I could do, I'm teaching a course right now, so we need a whole semester to talk about all things animal testing, but very briefly, Animals are primarily used in two key areas of the life sciences. One is to understand the molecular basis of disease. So to disease research essentially, essentially, which is known as biomedical research. So to understand how humans develop disease and, and to develop drugs against them. So that's quite different from the kind of testing that we are talking about today with respect to Bill S5. So that's toxicity testing or regulatory testing. So this is the testing of chemicals um, and products containing chemicals like pesticides um, and paint, industrial chemicals, industrial waste, um, effluents, things like that, right? Things, the waste that you get from petrochemical refineries, all of those things and household cleaners. Um, all of those are chemicals that are in consumer or industrial usage. So testing of those is quite different from looking for, you know, to understanding disease um, and to try and trying to develop um, drugs against them. So those are, those are the two key areas of animal use in general. Yeah, and that's important for us to understand because um, they are, you know, they're very different. They're different people we're dealing with, um, but they also dovetail into each other. Like movement on this means movement elsewhere, right? 
So yeah, so tell us a little bit about toxicity testing in particular. So toxicity testing is really trying to understand the effects of these chemicals like pesticides, like paint and household cleaners and all of those on human health and also on the environment, um, right? Pe things like pesticides and industrial chemicals are out there and it's not just us who are affected, it's also ecological species. Um, and even companion animals who are exposed to these potentially through our waterways, through land, air, all of that, right? So um, this is why they're known as regulated chemicals. Oftentimes, you're not able to release these into um, the market, into society without going through a regulatory agency like Health Canada um, or U.S. Environment Protection Agency or European Chemicals Agency. So this is what regulatory testing is for regulated chemicals. And the way that this testing is done is to look at how humans will potentially be exposed to um, these chemicals. And usually it is through uh, a, a certain route of exposure, whether you are eating it, so through ingestion, inhalation, and absorption, whether it's through your skin or through your eyes. So those are like the primary routes. And sometimes even, you know, intravenously, you could be exposed to certain things, but that's more applicable to drugs, really. So in terms of, you know, whether you're being uh, exposed to these chemicals through ingestion, inhalation, or, or absorption through skin and eye, then animals are exposed to these chemicals the same way. So they, we make these animals eat these chemicals, we make them inhale them, and we apply them on their eyes and skins mm -hmm. to, to then understand how that would affect them. And so if you go back to toxicology 101, there are two fundamental principles of toxicology, right? So why do you think that, you know, why do we even think that it is okay? So the two fundamental premises of toxicology is that if properly qualified, these animal tests are applicable to humans. That's one of the fundamental premises. And the other one is that the exposure of these animals to high doses of chemicals is a necessary and valid method. So oftentimes these animals are exposed to a hundred to a thousand times higher doses than we would ever be exposed to with the hope that you know, if they don't show any signs of toxicity or death or whatever that we're looking at, then we would also be okay. And we are not just looking at one or two little things or does it irritate the skin? It's not. It's a whole, I mean, there's so many different tests that are done, right? To look at hormone disruption, uh, developmental toxicity. So what happens to generations, right? What happens to babies? And so you can do these things over, it usually takes two to three years to do some of those uh, studies if there are birth defects and developmental like neurotoxicity what happens to your brain and to all of your target organs all the organs in the body uh, immune system um, neurological cancer cause whether they're cancer causing so there's a whole plethora of um, adverse effects that we test in animals and these are usually done through series of experiments where you, not only are you looking at the route of exposure, how it enters the body, but also for different durations, if it's acute, right? Just a single exposure for a day or up to 14 days or subacute up to 28 days um, and subchronic up to 90 days. There's a dog test that's done for 90 days um, or even more chronic up to two to three years. The cancer bioassay usually takes over two years to do. Wow. And, and may I add, yes, that animals please. are not given painkillers during these procedures, right? These are all animals are exposed to these things. And often, you know, some of these things, they are well beyond their pain tolerance threshold. Mm. It's, it's just as excruciating. And, and, and not only are they subjected to these tests, but in between the tests, I mean, what they're, they're in like, metal cages isolated not you know there's just there's everything in their life is is hell uh, absolutely it, it's not ideal by any means whatsoever um and and you know the number one species uh used for chemical toxicity testing is usually mice and rats those are the primary species the the primary non-rodent species used in chemical testing is often dogs beagles mm -hmm. to be specific Mm -hmm. Um, Doris is asking, is toxicity testing legally required in Canada? Um, it is. 
yeah in a in okay. a in a way right that's the thing to get yeah. all of these so it's not like these standards weren't necessarily set by the Canadian government. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens is that all of these regula regulated chemicals, the regulatory testing is internationally harmonized. So all of these um, protocols, whether it is animal-based or non-animal, they are approved at organizations like the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. OECD has a chemical test guidelines program. So all of these protocols that are there, right? If you're looking at developmental toxicity, you can go in there, you can type this in and you will see the protocols that are needed um, to do the tests to, mm -hmm. to decide if a chemical causes toxicity in the brain um, or causes birth defects and things like that. So those are internationally harmonized guidelines that everyone really uses, especially the 35 OECD countries and all of almost all of the other countries, if, even if they're not officially OECD nations, um, they tend to adhere to the same guidelines. And some countries may have additional guidelines or, or let, you know, their own versions of certain things, but usually these are regulated chemicals that go through these internationally harmonized guidelines. Yes. So toxicity tests are legally required, but what can be changed is that these toxicity tests don't need to be done on animals. So Caitlin, um, and before we move on to though, uh, there is approximately now you say 105,000 plus animals a year being used in toxicity tests. Is that right, Charu? Did I get that right? So in general, um, in Canada, uh, we use between over the last three, four, five years, we've used between 3.5 to over 5 million animals a year. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're in different categories and different categories of pain. But in general, there's one called regulatory testing. So it is for things like this. Um, and I think in 2022, that's, those are the latest numbers we have. We used 174,000 and some animals for regulatory testing. And of those, um, 105,000 were category E. And this is, well, these are tests that are well beyond the pain tolerance threshold of conscious, unanesthetized animals. Mm. Um, so that, that's what those numbers are. But Canada also, we don't have an, these are not, these are estimates. These are not full accurate numbers. Um, and, and then there may also be other numbers, you know, so we used, I think, 2 million, I believe, close to that. 40 to 60% of these animals are used for fundamental studies. So there might be some toxicity testing done on those animals as well. If it was happening in a, um, a research laboratory, for example, it may not belong to the regulatory testing category, but it could be toxicology in general. Mm. And, and, uh, you know, also the fact is that there is no oversight, um, that is like no legal sort of oversight from our government as far as these animals go. So that's part of the reason that there's not more transparency, right? C can you just talk to that a little bit? Um, Caitlin, can you talk a little bit about the trans, you know, the sort of, um, uh, lack of oversight in animal use in science? Yeah, for sure. I think it's something that um, really surprises people when we talk about it. Um, so there are no federal laws limiting the use of animals in testing or um, regulating their treatment. What we do have is what, what Charu has mentioned, the CCAC, Canadian Council on Animal Care, um, which, you know, will, will inspect certain labs and, but, you know, they're not um, a public enforcement agency. So the tools that they have to you know, uphold standards or, or make sure that companies have an incentive to comply are, are quite limited. And that's, um, let's make it clear that this is basically an industry created uh, group, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a private group and, and it's voluntary. So mm -hmm. if you are receiving federal funding or if you choose to opt into the CCA fra CCAC framework, then, you know, you have to report on the animals that you're using and, and other um, information about how you're using them. But if you choose not to opt in, if you're a private facility and you choose, you're not getting federal funding, you decide you don't want to opt in to see CCAC, that's it. Uh, nobody's going in to monitor the use of the animals. Um, you know, if let's say some somebody in the lab made a cruelty complaint to law enforcement agencies, well, then maybe you'd see someone enter there. But um, who's going to be making those complaints? Obviously not the animals themselves. So it's it's a huge gap in our legal system. Hmm. 
And, and Charu, I just, you know, I, I want, I also think it's important for people to understand that this isn't just an issue for animals. This is also an issue for, for human safety, uh, testing on animals and the lack of efficacy. Can you comment a little bit on that? So the term efficacy, again, it would be very specific to drug testing. Okay. Um, okay so yeah. with the chemical, yeah. we're not looking for an efficacy. We're just okay, looking for okay. adverse effects, right? Thank you. Thank you. And you know what? <laughs> I'm going to get you to give us a little 101 on, on some of these terminologies because yeah. we're going to be asking folks to be talking so about this. To, <laughs> yes, thank you. Clarify. So when we're talking about, you know, that whole, yes, animal suffering, animal um pain, animal ethics, all of that, uh, clearly, that's, that's, that's a big concern. But um, the, uh, the other issue is that are we really benefiting, right? We're doing science on animals to benefit humans, but are we really benefiting? And when we're talking about drug testing, or drug understanding disease using animals and trying to develop drugs using animals, um, it's quite evident now over the past century, regardless of the amount of work that we've done, uh, about 95% of drugs, right? Even in some cases, over 95% of drugs tested to be safe and effective um, or safe or effective or both in animals um, fail in human clinical trials. And with toxicity testing, you're not really looking for efficacy. You're looking for certain effects, adverse effects, whether it causes birth defects or whether it causes cancer or you know, um, disrupts your hormones and that type of thing. So with those, the numbers aren't that much better. It's anywhere from the predictive value, as you call it, um, the ability to take animal data and apply it to humans can range anywhere from like 43% in some cases to 89% in the better cases. So in some assays, in some tests, you might as well flip a coin because that's the accuracy you're going to get yeah. by applicability um, to human biology. Yeah, it's it's a ridiculous <laughs> a ridiculous discrepancy and um uh, and I don't think most people understand that. Uh, so so thank you for that. Charu, while we're on the subject, so efficacy is for drug use, uh, tolerance is for, uh, and adverse effects is for um, toxicity testing. What are some other things that when we're talking about this issue, terms, because I have heard scientists complain like animal advocates, they don't even know the right terms. They talk about research and they talk about testing and experimentation. Can you give us a little bit of an idea of some things that we should be careful about? So I think the primary difference is the difference between disease research and toxicity testing, right? So toxicity testing, chemical safety testing, toxicity testing, regulatory testing, those would be sort of in the same kind of category mm -hmm. where you're trying to understand the hazard, the, the adverse effect um, of the, the potential for a chemical to cause that and the risk, the likelihood of expo ex likelihood of um, that causing harm to you. So there are a number of different factors that are taken into account, just looking at the chemical, physical properties of a chemical and whether it's just a single chemical or if it's in a mixture with a number of other chemicals, how it behaves on its own and as a, as a mixture and how that would affect and how are you exposed to it? And is it over short periods, long periods and through what, you know, is it through food? Is it, and then the, how does it accumulate in your body, right? cumulative exposure from different routes, different, you know, whether you're working in an industrial site or if you're just getting it from food or just from walking on land that had been contaminated with something, or uh, waterways, right? So there's so many different things in terms of, it's not the same as looking for, oh, here's a drug, potential drug for Alzheimer's disease, let's see if it works. So that, the mentality, the, the science behind it, the, the experimentation, Everything that goes into that is quite different um, from doing toxicity testing. Toxicity testing is where you literally, it, with animals, it's known as descriptive whole animal studies. With animals, we're just trying to see what the hell does it do, right? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes there's a, a test called lethal dose 50. So you give as much um, as possible to calculate. So as much um, chemical as they can eat or inhale, um, until 50% of the animals die. Um, so, and oftentimes that's used then to calculate a, a no adverse effect level for humans. 
So there are different things that, but the primary thing to remember is if you're, you know, especially with regard to this bill, if you're writing, like, don't talk about efficacy, don't talk about the failures in drug development. It has yeah. nothing to do with this. Yeah. Uh, you know, we will have to at some point deal with the drug uh, development guidelines in the future. This but is the building blocks, this, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but for this particular bill, it's, it's chemical exposure, chemical risk and chemical uh, hazards and chemical exposure um, mm. using animal data to um, come up with how to deal with these chemicals in our society. And just to put things into perspective, there are about 350,000 registered chemicals and mixtures in the world most of which do not have full toxicology data. Oh. Meaning we may know that, okay, it causes cancer, but we might not know that it causes endocrine disruption, that it disrupts the hormone. So some of most of these chemicals may have one or two things that we know about them, but not the whole multitude of adverse effects that it could potentially cause. And if we were to rely on animal methods to do this, it will literally take centuries to complete and cost, I don't know, trillions of dollars and hundreds of millions of animal lives. Mm. It's simply not practical either. Yes, it's mm -hmm. not practical. And, you know, um, Lori from the Beagle Alliance, you know, is pointing out that even on these non-lethal exp uh, experiments as testing, um, they are, they're not allowed to live their life out if they somehow survive. It's not like they are retired to a sanctuary. Um, they're, they're usually killed afterwards. Is that right, Charu? So it, the sanctuary concept uh, applies to higher order mammals, mm -hmm. right? So dogs and maybe even pigs and primates. Mm -hmm. um, non-human primates those are the ones who are often released but you know most of these um, like rodent studies rats and mice those are lethality is the end point mm -hmm. um, they have to be killed to open up their you know to look at the internal organs to see what happens if there's cancer in the liver um, or what what happened and many of these tests have um, lethality death as the end point so that's what we have to do. So, I mean, a lot of animals are killed. Um, it's barely, but with some disease conditions, maybe animals can be released, but a lot of these toxicity testing, animals are not going to be in a good condition to be even released. Thank you. Um, so Caitlin, there's very recently been a pretty big breakthrough in this issue of toxicity testing in Canada. Can you give us a, a little rundown on Bill S5 and where, what's what it's all about and where it is at right now? Yeah, so Bill S5 uh, was passed into law in June of last year, uh, and it was a really exciting step. We worked really hard on it at Animal Justice, um, and a number of other groups worked really hard on it as well, of course. Charu, uh, Humane Canada, Humane Society International, and, and groups across the country, really. Um, so it was a huge team effort. And Bill S5 overhauls SEPA, which is the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, which is Canada's toxics law. And it's a huge bill. So uh, we're talking about toxicity testing today. And you know, for me, that, that's what I worked on. And I'm really excited about those parts. But it's a huge bill. Um, it does, it does uh, a lot of different things. Um, but when it comes to toxicity testing, when we saw the bill originally introduced, we saw that there was um, some preambular language, um, and that's something that we had to actually work really hard for too. Um, but it just meant in the principal section of the act, basically recognizing that you know we need to reduce uh, and replace and refine the use of animals. And so you know we saw that that preambular language. We thought, well, that's a great first step, but that's not really going to get us anywhere. So we worked really hard to add some stronger legal tools to the bill, both at the Senate and then at the House of Commons, so that we could actually see a phase out of toxicity testing on animals. In the last federal election, the Liberal Party committed to ending the use of animals on toxicity testing by 2035. And what we said is, well, like if you're going to meet that commitment, which we absolutely should, uh, we're going to need some strong legal tools to get there. We can't just, you know, rely on um, the existing situation and business as usual. So um, we're really excited. We got a lot of uh, really important amendments in the act. Um, and, you know, I'm, I've been on here already and spoken with you about them. But the one that's most relevant today is that um, there is a requirement in the statute now that the ministers, and that's the Minister of Health and the Minister of Environment, that they develop a plan to um, 
basically, you know, show us how they're going to increase the use and validation of non-animal methods in order to reduce and replace and refine use of animals and toxicity testing. So it's really exciting. A plan doesn't sound that exciting, but we've seen in other jurisdictions like the United States that having a plan is actually a really, really important tool to make sure that we stay on track to actually ending use altogether. Mm, and so um, that plan is is go ticking along right now, and I'm going to get a few more details um, from you on that in, in just a second. But um, Charu, um, one of the main uh, sort of fears, I think, from the public and maybe even government officials and certainly the scientific community is, uh, can we replace this testing with non-animal uh, testing methods. Where are we in terms of development of that, you know, both globally and in Canada? So globally, we are going towards it. And so once again, um, the we, we are quite far ahead in the toxicology field compared to medical research and drug development in terms of replacing animals. So at the OECD chemical test guidelines program, I believe there's like 40 um, guidelines now for non-animal methods. And what we are seeing with those is that they are more predictive and we can actually rely on that information um, to look at you know, what adverse effects it would cause for humans and to rely on these methods um, to figure out if something is toxic and, and what, you know, to derive those. Like, I guess the best example I can give is when you look at like a bottle of cleaner or something, you've seen those little signs, right? The skull and, and bones and these other, the exclamation mark with a heart sign or whatever, like all those things, all those warning signs are derived from animal data. But what if we could do that using other methods? And so what we're seeing right now is that these new approach methods or non-animal methods or NAMs for short, um, that they are more predictive and oftentimes they're cheaper and faster um, and we're able to get more information that's more human relevant. Um, so we are quite, when we're thinking about it, yes, we are quite far ahead in terms of moving this. And I think globally, there is a, a big need to do it. And people are constantly, and I participated in an OECD meeting back in December, where you know over 100 people from the 35 nations participated to talk about how do we expedite the validation of these methods, right? To make sure that these methods are, uh, good enough and that they are doing the work the the they have the predictive value that we're looking for quote unquote right um that there would be applicable so they're it's progressing well um in other countries countries like the united states and the european union they've invested hundreds of millions i'm, I'm gonna say you know over the last decade like over a billion you know tons of money that have been poured into this to develop these methods, to validate them, um, and to get them approved at an international organization like the OECD so that everyone can start using them. Mm -hmm. So all of this work is happening and I think it's promising. So there are things like skin sensitization, for example, that's like looking at um, the effect, the allergic responses in response to skin contact, repeated skin exposure uh, to a chemical. This used to be done with guinea pigs and mice. And those tests have now completely been replaced with human cell-based tests. These are actually quite simple tests, not even really complicated organ on chip, like fancy um, 21st century technology, but very basic like cells in a Petri dish type of test. It's been completely replaced. And it, 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 when you look at the data, it's more predictive. It's more applicable to humans than any of those animal tests were in the past. And even last year, there was another uh, protocol that was approved for eye irritation and eye corrosion um, and things like that at the OECD level. So the field is moving quite fast, but I do have to say that we have to be realistic. There are some things for which like developmental neurotoxicity. So this is looking at toxicity to your brain in the developing fetus. We don't have all the non-animal methods to replace that yet, but people are working on it. And the animal method is not good, but right now around the world, animal data is better than no data. So yes, everyone's working really hard. There are some tests that we have not yet found replacements for, but this is where we really need to put all of our effort together nationally and internationally to really get these tests 
you know, if if a test doesn't exist, let's develop it. And if the tests exist, let's exist, let's validate them. And for appropriate use, appropriate context of use, that's that's a, an official term that's used, because every test is not applicable to everything. So this is really at the end of the day, if I may say this, like replacing human biology with cells in a petri dish or a computer com computer model is not that simple. But the beauty of this thing is that you can look at different things. What happens at the DNA level? What happens at the tissue organ level? What happens at the, the whole body level? And you can take information from these different areas and do computational modeling and combine it all together. And even when I'm talking about like the test that I mentioned for skin sensitization, the two animal tests were replaced by two uh, to three human cell-based tests. So you get information on different levels, whether what happens at the molecular level, what happens at the tissue level, and you combine it together. So these are the types of new approaches that are being employed to develop these frameworks for testing. Right, so it's not just about developing the technology, it's about shifting the approaches um, of, of how people do, do science, do testing, right? Right, because like this is what I said, oftentimes all of this, if you look at some of these tests that were developed, many of these tests were developed in the 50s and 60s, and they were never really fully validated mm. to see if they're applicable to humans, but they were developed at that time, and then it's been in use, it's one of these things, it's been like that forever, and now we are making um, an intentional effort because partly... Uh, for a number of different reasons that I mentioned, the, you know, it's, it's very slow, it, like a cancer bioassay could take over two years to do. Um, and the screening of these tens of thousands of chemicals will take a long time, setting aside the animal ethics, I mean, it will take a long time, it'll cost so much money, and we won't get the results we want that quickly, and you don't know if the results will be applicable at the end. So can we now come up with these other methods? And it requires a different kind of mindset. So if you're looking at, if you're giving an animal, if you're feeding an animal a pesticide and just looking to see what kills, you know, at what dose does it kill them, it's very different from trying to figure out at what concentration can something happen in humans for the liver, for the, the brain. Um, so it requires sort of breaking down human biology into bite-sized pieces. More and it's, it's, it's really amazing though, when you, when you do it, it's, it's an exciting field of science. Yes, absolutely. And, and we know here, you know, all of us, we are champions of animals. And so we just want to see animal testing stopped for any reason. But it's really important that the people and the players and the stakeholders we're dealing with, I mean, they're in it for different reasons, right? And so we do need to talk about, um, you, you know, that that testing uh, is doesn't have the same validity in animals. And we need to be able to uh, talk about t time. And we need to talk about money concerns, because that's that is what's going to move the people that are actually the gatekeepers of, of, of this arena. Um, May so, I just uh, yeah. respond to one little quick thing that I happened to come across? Yes, when I absolutely. Said that no testing is, or animal testing is better than no testing. That's not yeah. my personal opinion. That yeah. is the opinion of the regulators of yeah. the industry of, you know, chemical companies that are putting these chemicals out or agencies like Health Canada and US EPA. Yeah. This is the thing, right? Because at the end of the day, they also have, we have to, we can't be combative with everything. We also have to understand how the system works right now um, mm -hmm. and try to see how we can change that system in a systematic way. Um, and so with them, yes, if you are a, a regulator at the US EPA and some you know, la pregnant lady walks into these offices and say, is my child going to be safe? Uh, because of this pesticide, like those people also have some, um, right? They have that responsibility. So what is the globally accepted way of doing that right now? It's using animals. Is that the best thing? No, it's not. But right now that's what it is. So we are trying to change that um, whole process. Absolutely. Thanks, Charu, for um, expanding on that. Um, so Caitlin, can you take us through what you think most needs to be done in Canada right now to meet the goal of phase out of uh, toxicity testing um, by this by 2035 as as the government has has promised to, in their election a run up? Yeah, there's a lot on the go still. So we saw this this huge step taken in June when the law was actually changed. And so now we have at least some legal tools, which is great. Um, 
so the question is, you know, will that translate into action for animals? And so I think a lot of stuff needs to happen. So there's a regulatory consultation going on. That's a separate thing than what we're talking about today, but basically thinking about, well, okay, we have regulations under this, this law that gives some detail about what kinds of testing needs to be done. So we need to start amending those regulations to make it very clear to companies um, that, the data doesn't need to come from animals and in fact, pushing them in, in another direction. So that's one piece that we're working on. Um, there's a consultation happening this month and that's something that we're gonna talk about today. And so, you know, Canada is now developing an actual strategy to reduce, replace and refine the use of animals and toxicity testing. So uh, we need that strategy to be strong. We need it to be developed quickly and then we need to see actual action on it, of course. Um, and, you know, in parallel with what we do, which is, or what I do, I guess, which is the law side of things, we need to be supporting the work that Charu is doing because we can talk about the need for non-animal methods all we want. We can have a law that says, you know, any scientifically valid non-animal method has to be used. That's not what the law says, but it could. But if there is no scientifically valid non-animal method, then we're not getting anywhere. So mm -hmm. it's it's an area where we really need to see, you know, members of the public talking to their elected officials. We need to see strong legal and regulatory tools, and we need to be supporting the scientific work that Charu and others are doing. Mm, absolutely. And Charu has been just trucking away now for years and, and, and created the center out of nowhere. And, um, but, but centers like hers in other parts of the world are being incredibly funded by governments you know, and, and by industry, you know, and, and so how that happening right now, do we, Charu? Yeah, so centers equivalent to mine in other countries in the U.S., um, Europe, European Union, and in, in other parts of the world as well, they are federally funded, um, and not just the centers themselves, but like national programs, where hundreds of millions of dollars have been committed to developing these methods, to validating, and even just the validation studies, for example. So at the OECD level, for example, to get one test approved, you have to do, conduct multi-center validation, um, often in doing these tests in different continents as well. And to do some of those tests, it, it could range, depending on the complexity of the test, it could range anywhere from 300 to 700,000 euros to do. Um, and so these countries have invested in that. The EU and the US, they have done multiple, um, multiple, many validation studies. Um, Canada to this day has done zero. Like the Canadian government has not yet done, taken on a validation study of that magnitude, for example, right? But that doesn't mean there's no interest, right? So I want to make something very clear. There are brilliant scientists at Health Canada and Environment and Climate Change Canada who are absolutely committed to this, um, to coming up with more predictive and protective methods to safeguard us, our animals, and our environment. Um, but we need funding for all of that. So Canada um, has never really funded um, animal free science specifically. Uh, for these reasons, for regulatory testing. So tell us a little bit more about the Canadian Centre for Alternatives to Animals uh, at, at the University of Windsor. You know, um, what part do you, are you, do you need to play in this for us to be able to meet this target at, in 2035? And I, we all wish it could be much sooner than that. Um, and so, you know, you're really the only centre that's poised to be able to help significantly, significantly with that? So, um, I don't know. I don't kind of like to talk about okay, myself like that. You be but, quiet, Char. Can, um, can you talk a little uh, bit about that? So, yes, my, my center is the person only and the national hub and the international um, interface. So, I have a seat at the table in this international consortia alongside Health Canada. So, Health Canada is the primary regulator and the signatory to organizations like the OECD. Um, and they did do a fantastic job representing Canada and moving this forward. There hasn't been even money for Health Canada scientists um, to do some of this work. And that has to come from the federal government, right? Um, so um, in terms of my center, um, I have three key pillars where I work on developing and validating methods for medical research. So understanding disease and all of that. 
And then there is a regulatory pillar, which is um, supporting Health Canada's um, role in developing, validating, and promoting and promoting the regulatory acceptance of these methods. Um, and then I have an academic pillar where I'm training the next generation to think outside the cage. So to this day, I have not received a penny from the federal government. Um, and all, most of my funding has come from uh, the, the incredible generosity of Canadians. And I have also received a number of um, grants, um, in, in, small grants for the most part, and um, some industry contributions as well. But if there is any hope of like meeting the 2035 deadline, we need to pour in money. And the role that I can play, and I have presented this to um, Health Canada and Environment Canada officials as well, there's a lot that we can do as a country. I feel that Canada, we have that, we have the brain power. There are so many people in this country who are creative, who are brilliant, who have amazing ideas. And whether you are a computational modeler or doing cell culture work, and I do like 3D bioprinting human tissue in my laboratory. Um, so we can bring all of these together. And that is the role that my center can play. This is the national hub. I can bring the different sectors together, industry, academia, government, and nonprofit sectors, uh, bring the key players together and support Health Canada's role in meeting the vision that's outlined in this in this legislation. Um, and there are somebody so many... fund this scientist. Come on already. <laughs> so many different. I I have a big vision for the country, yeah. but you know my hands are tied. You can only do so much. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot that we can actually do to really carve a niche. So there are some some areas I, you know, where ten different countries are working on it. That's not what we want to do. Um, I'm working with Health Canada to sort of identify the Canadian needs. You know, what are our priorities, our regulatory needs? Um, what is the area that we want to tackle? And what is the area where we are going to take leadership? And that's what it is. Canada has never been a leader in this field. We've just followed along. And why? You know, can mm -hmm. we just like really um, take a leadership in this role, like put our country on the map in this burgeoning international field and make our contributions. And this is something that's gonna last for a long time. This is not a one-off thing, right? We're essentially changing a paradigm in science. We're talking about effects for generations to come. Mm. Yes, Charu, absolutely. And I hope that the Prime Minister of Canada is watching this. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't need to be the PM. In fact, it can just be your MP. And and so I I, I want to talk about the action that we are putting out to AJAers specifically, um, because we need the super soldier help on this. Um, we've got almost 70 people here live right now, and we're going to have lots of people watching this replay. Um, Caitlin, uh, we've developed a, a, an AJA action brief um, to be able to guide folks in what the next steps are. One of them is around the Canadian Centre for Alternatives to Animal um, Testing, but we are going to um, talk about the first thing that folks can do. So, um, Caitlin, tell us a little bit about what's happening this month that we are going to ask AJAers to participate in. Yeah, so there's a really exciting opportunity this month. Um, Environment and Climate Change Canada and Health Canada have posted a notice of intent to develop a strategy in order to guide their efforts to reduce, replace, and refine the use of animals in toxicity testing. So this is, you know, that that plan that the law says they now have to develop. Well, they're going ahead and doing it, which is great. And Amazing. so we have until January 29th to submit comments. And it sounds a bit daunting. It sounds a bit daunting even to me because I'm not a scientist. You know, what do I have to contribute? But really at, at this stage, they're looking for the key elements that will go into the strategy. And there's some really good stuff already in there, but I think there's some really important points that certainly I intend to make, and I hope many of you will also make, uh, in order to ensure that the strategy is as strong as possible and that we see as much action as possible for animals. Yeah, absolutely. So we have developed an AJA action brief, which Ina has um, uh, wonderfully put into the chat. This is going to take you through a a everything you need to do if this is a place of passion for you, or hopefully we've sparked the passion in you today. Um, and it's it's really simple. It's not one of those 
comment uh, sort of forms that you have to fill out. All we're asking you to do is send an email uh, and we will, we have the email address to send it to, to submit comments uh, in the action brief. Um, we have given you talking points. We've given um, a few key points to make in comments. Um, and it, correct me if I'm wrong, Caitlin, but I don't think you even have to outline all of these comments. Um, no. If we have various people sending in one aspect and another person sending in another aspect, you know, choose, uh, choose one that appeals to you or that you feel strongly about and and just riff on that a little bit. Um, yeah, is that right, it, Caitlin? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, the key here really is that we are supporting their efforts, uh, which is nice too, because often, you know, we're, we're taking actions to stop something or to fight back, right? And, and here is our opportunity where the government's actually doing a really good thing to step up and say, you know, I support you. I thank you for doing this. And here are some ways you can go even further. So, you know, what, what we really want is for them to, to hear loud and strong that there is strong support for this work. And then, you know, we, as you said, we've set out some points that you can make specifically, um, but, you know, it's up to you, you know, you, you, can, you can look at what we've set out and you can pick whether to make one point or three points, you can add your own point. Um, but, you know, the key is really just to make sure that they hear loud and strong this message that Canadians wanna see action because they're going to be hearing comments against this, right? Like it, it seems like a no brainer, but there will be pushback. Am I, am I right on that? There'll be some, I mean, I'm curious about how much in the U S um, when they amended their toxics law, there was uh, a fair bit of pushback um, and from environmental groups. Uh, so far we haven't seen that in Canada actually, which is, okay, which is really nice. I was, I was worried about that, you know, an environmental lawyer in my past life. So uh, I did reach out to my colleagues at these groups and and so far I'm not really hearing much. I've heard some some concerns from some groups, but for the most part, I think that we're all on the same page. And um, I know that when I talk to my former colleagues, I, I think they can believe me when I say that, you know, I want to see the environment protected too. I don't I don't want a world where we're releasing chemicals into the environment that have not been adequately tested and that we don't know whether or not they're safe. We absolutely need to make sure that things are safe before we're using it in this country. I don't want my kids exposed to chemicals in their shampoo or in cleaning products if it's going to have an adverse effect on them 10 years down the road. Um, but the question is, how are we doing that testing? And the current way that we're doing it, it just isn't working. It's not working for us. It's not working for animals and it's not working for the environment. Mm hmm. Amazing. Yeah. So so the reason, uh, you know, animal justice as an organization, we're, we're going to get do a mass sort of um, email, you know, that we're going to get people to uh, sign on. Uh, but we really need, again, our AJ super soldiers to do more um, detailed, customized emails, because those are the ones they're really going to look at and they're actually going to put some weight on. And then we know you're capable of that. You know that you we've trained you in this. And so, again, the AJ brief will give you all the information you need. Um, you can keep it really simple. It doesn't have to be complicated. And um, and we touch on the various things like scientific validity for uh, non-animal methods, um, uh, what we, you know, what we should be doing as far as transparency um, in this testing, about the deadline, about the funding. Um, mm -hmm. And so let's, uh, so so I'm, I'm going to ask, you know, who here um, is uh, ready to take action on uh, submitting some comments? Who here here is going to commit to um, taking action on submitting the comments. Just put yes, yeah, hell yes in in the comments so that we can see it. And uh, okay, yes, yes, I'm seeing that. I'm planning. Yes, okay. Do you see that? This is wonderful. I love it. 100%. Hands up. Okay, excellent. Now we have a part two, and this is for the folks that are listening to Charu and 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 like me are saying give this scientist some money. Um, we need to make sure that this is part of our push. And you all, Animal Justice Academy members, have been trained in meeting with MPs. And so this is one of those times, folks. Um, we are going to ask that, um, that if you are moved to do this, that you meet with your MP to talk about how this center, Charo Center, needs to be funded by the government in order to meet the government's own um, deadlines. So Caitlin, can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah, it would be great for MPs to hear this message from their constituents. I speak to um, MPs and I raise this issue with them. And there are some really, really strong champions um, in a number of political parties for Charu, for the work she's doing for this issue. So it's not that this will be the first time that it comes up. But I think what we need is to have more voices putting pressure on the finance minister, you know, the prime minister's office, um, and saying, you know, we really need funding that, that's dedicated to this. If we're actually going to make good on these commitments that we've made, then we're going to have to put our money where our mouth is. Um, and of course, you know, we all know that government funding is uh, challenging these days, as, as it always is. But this is such an important issue. And we really, really hope that with your efforts and with our efforts and with Charo's efforts, um, that we'll see a government announcement in the near future. Okay. Amazing. So. Yeah, that would be uh, incredible. Honestly, my center is on a on a shoestring budget. It's not sustainable the way it is. I mean, I will still keep this running and do small things, but that's not the thing. I think in a very short period of time, I've shown what I'm capable of and what we can do in Canada. There's a big vision, and I think there's enough support from Canadian. I'm meeting with Canadian industry groups. There is tremendous interest in making Canada a leader in this field. Um, and there are, like I said, brilliant scientists in the government of Canada. And then the ones who developed, who are develop, who developed this first uh, draft of this um, strategic plan and who are going to be developing it, there's so much interest. And so it is, um, it is absolutely critical to get this funding and what I would do without it. We won't do any of these things. And certainly there's no dedicated funding. There's no way that would we would meet that 2035 deadline or even reduce 10% by then if there's no funding. Um, and so we really need to step up our game and do that. And I think it's really critical um, for, and, and the thing is that, you know, I can't wait. Like I just, there's so many things we could do with funding. Um, and to take that leadership role and to do this and to do it on a timeline. Char dreams of these things every night, I'm sure. You know, she's she's already built it all in her mind. She just needs the money to fuel it. <laughs> and it's not just Char, but the easy. folks It's not with, easy yes. being in this this position, right? And I've yeah. said this before in, in uh, you know, to your community and to everyone. Um, there's a lot that can be done and we're not doing our part um, here in Canada and, you know, we can change that. There's yeah. hope. So it's not all, you know, doom and gloom, but there's hope, but money runs everything, honestly. And right? there's tons of ideas. There are projects and things that I'm talking about with red, the regulators and with industry and with, you know, academic partners, but there's really no investment in this. And um, I would really like to, uh, this budget is important because we're coming up on an election year. And so we don't want to, you know, take this into the next year. You don't know what would happen and all of that. So it's really important. And, and just to give a, a very quick thing, um, in the U.S. and in the European Union, oftentimes when these legislations are passed, it's almost always associated with a part of money or like to see that oh we lost you charu we we're we're losing your audio for some reason uh -oh. oh i think you might be back okay maybe try turning your camera off for a second charu just so we can hear you it might oh. help okay sorry what where did i you um uh, you said um uh, which part did you not hear? <laughs> we we just didn't hear the last line. I think you said something about I'm not sure if I can say this. <laughs> Lost you. Oh no no no! I was gonna say that there's so much that we could do here, yes. and it won't happen without any funding, right? right? Like the 2035 deadline is just a dream. Yeah. If there's no funding, yes, absolutely. And one other thing that I want to quickly mention um to your community is that. Um, you know, this whole issue is not simple. If you are a multinational company that has to get a certain chemical approved, even if Canada says, no, we don't need animal data, there might be 50 other countries that require the data. And so they have to do the animal testing anyway, right? So this is a national and a global issue. So, mm -hmm. and this is where we really need to play a national role to get our um, act together. 
Mm -hmm. And then to contribute to international efforts and without funding, we can't contribute to these international efforts um, either. And then every time a new technology is developed, we need to get Health Canada and Environment Canada, USFDA, EPA, European Chemicals Agency to accept these into that regulatory risk assessment process. So there's a, there are so many different facets to this. It's not just about the technology, but how do we do it to get industry on board? Um, so there are multiple facets to this it's not a simple issue but we've shown now it can be done it is mm. happening mm. we just need to accelerate it amazing thank you okay so there's some questions that have been asked who exactly do we need to fund canadian center for alternatives to animal methods <laughs> <laughs> um, is who we need to fund. That's who we're trying to get the uh, the government to fund. And of course, um, Ken put in a link to uh, the center itself in case anybody wants to do a direct donation. Um, uh, someone was asking when we submit comments, who's going to be reading them? Uh, and I believe you said Health Canada. Is that right, Charu? Mostly? Like uh, yes, the strategy will be developed primarily by Health Canada, but Environmental Climate Change Canada is also involved. Okay. Okay. Got it. And um, if you are, well, first of all, I want to hear, are you somebody who is willing to go and see your MP um, to talk about this issue? Put it in, put, yes, um, I'm doing this. Commit to us. Uh, let Charu know that she's not alone in this, folks. And um, just so you know, we have put some talking points in the AJ action brief around that too. So just, you know, to make sure that you know that there is support there. Okay. Um, so anything else that I've missed? Uh, Caitlin, Charu, around this? I'm seeing lots of yeses. This is great. No, um, that's incredible. No, I, I just uh, want to reiterate the fact that I personally feel, professionally as well, um, that there's a lot that we could do, like the strategic plan that I have, that I have uh, proposed to the government on some of the things that we could do. It's not just developing a test, but also 10 years from now, right? By 2035, we need to have people at Health Canada, these evaluators, the regulators who are there to look at data coming from these new non-animal methods and to make decisions about safety for Canadians. My center is training that next generation of scientists. I'm doing all of that. I need funding. So it's not just to develop a test and to, to validate it, but it's this whole package. And this is an area where Canada can truly take leadership and, and that we can work together to make things happen. So funding is for the whole cause. Uh, I loved so what you that, said that very program. quick. I loved what you said really quickly earlier. You, you're training people to think outside of the cage. That's that's your thing. And and that's what we 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 really want to support. And, and honestly, it's uplifting. I just started teaching again. So I developed Canada's first course in this field, mm -hmm. right? It's called the human subject, animal free methods in biomedical research and toxicology. And my first day of class was on Monday. And I did this quick unofficial poll on Slido. And uh, I have about 40 uh, students in, in the class right now. And 87%, I, I, one of the questions, I had 15 questions for them, just to gauge what they know about animal testing and all of this. And one of the questions that I ask often, not just for this class, but in general, when, whenever I talk to students is, if you had the choice between animal testing and, and non-animal methods, what would you prefer? And the choice in the answers are, I prefer animal methods, I prefer non-animal methods, I prefer both. 87% of this particular class said I prefer non-animal methods. And this is something that I've seen. The, the new generation that we have before us, they're open-minded. They want this, they get excited every time I teach. I mean, this is one of the most fulfilling things in my role right now is to watch them you know, with their mouths open when I talk about organ on chip technology, how you could predict human biological responses better than with animals and just teaching them, exposing them to these new technologies and this new world. I mean, realistically, if the European Union and the United States really go along with their expedited plans to phase out chemical toxicity testing and the, so much is going to be different within the next 10 to 20 years. And we need to train these scientists who are going to go work in industry, work in technology development. They can come up with new ideas on how to replace developmental neurotoxicity tests. Uh, so we need to train them. We need to develop these tests. We need to work with our regulators. We can't just harass them and say, oh, don't do animal testing. That doesn't help. Let's help them you know, move away from this. They are also bound by certain laws and certain regulations that are 
internationally uh, governed. And so can we work together and do make that happen? Because the future to me is very bright. And that's what keeps me going. That's why I can work 18 hour days. Um, uh, because I, I believe that it can happen. You know what, Charu and Caitlin, this has just been the best way to start off 2024 because I I, I think I'm gonna call you um Reverend Charu. The way that you can, <laughs> you know, the way you can get people inspired is amazing. People, you are a visionary and inspirational leader in this field. Uh Dr. Charu Rene, uh, Renee said, you know, uh, saying, I'm so inspired, you have inspired us. And and I know, I know from seeing Caitlin, uh, you know, you put so much of your heart and soul in this last year year um to this topic in the last two years and um and and so you know Caitlin is holding holding things uh behind the scenes while you know like uh Reverend Charu is is, is singing you know um <laughs> and and you're both incredible to me you're brilliant and you're and your heart uh, you have hearts of gold and so thank you so much um yeah Debbie says uh just you're all inspirational um and folks uh don't forget um, the action brief that we shared here. I've also sent it out uh, this morning in an email to your entire list. If you're part of the Animal Justice Academy, you'll have it. We'll also be posting it in our Animal Justice Academy group. And I will be resharing it in a future newsletter probably next week as well. Um, and our next uh, Animal Justice Academy, we could go back to um, a gallery view, you know, so that uh, uh, that uh, Caitlin and Charu can see their adoring fans. Uh, our next Lunchtime Live will be back to Thursday, January 25th. Um, we will, uh, I'll be sending out the announcement about that soon. Um, if you aren't already getting our emails with these notices, make sure to sign up at animaljusticeacademy.com. And don't forget, if you appreciate the programming with Animal Justice Academy, you can always donate to us. Um, Ina will drop the donation uh, link into the chat just to keep our community strong and our programming going. Um, okay, AJ Ayers, can we please, actually, Ina, can we take off uh, the can we put on audio on? Can we give people the option to um, to take audio off? Okay, I want everybody to take your audio off and I just want you to say thank you to Caitlin and Charu for their beautiful work on this. Thank you. <laughs> you just have to, uh, yeah, nobody knows how to do this. They're, they're, they're not used to it. Um, so you can just thank unmute you. yourselves. There we go. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, AJers, for being Yay. here and being super soldiers. We really thank appreciate you. you. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.